Hi everybody, it's Greg Harrell here and it's VimConf Day. So instead of the usual screencast, what I'm actually going to do is give a run through of the talk that I'm going to give at VimConf. So it's called Sharpening the Axe and it started with a joke on Twitter a few months back. Lincoln said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening the axe. And I say, give me a series of simple programming tasks to do and I'll spend 10 years of my life tweaking my dot files repo. Now, President Lincoln almost certainly didn't actually say those words, but even though the attribution is dubious, the appeal of the argument is clear. The idea is that you can be more effective by making sure you're prepared and have the right tools. So effective, in fact, that you'll get the job done sooner, even when you include the off-task time spent preparing. Now, when I tweeted about President Lincoln and sharpening the axe, I was only half joking. The bit about spending 10 years tweaking my dot files is actually somewhat of an understatement. I switched to Vim full time at the beginning of 2009, and I've had my dot files in a Git repo since around the same time. And from this graph of commits to that repo over that time span, you can conclude that I'm either one, a relentless optimizer, or two, somebody who's probably got a pretty tuned toolkit by now, or three, a master procrastinator. Now I'd like to think it's mostly about the first two. Could be a little bit about the third as well though. But there's another factor here, and that's not just my penchant for tinkering. It's that Vim itself and its surrounding ecosystem have changed quite dramatically over the last decade. What might have been a state-of-the-art Vim setup in 2010 would probably seem quite antiquated if we looked at it in 2020. Now, in 2010, Vim version 7 was the latest and greatest incarnation of Vim. It was about halfway through its decade-long reign. Version 7 retained its crown as the latest version for around 10 years. Vim was already 20 years old at that point, and its ultimate predecessor, VI, was approaching its 35th birthday. Things moved more slowly back then. Vim, a single-threaded editor, only had support for blocking, synchronous jobs. It was possible to write plugins in other languages, such as Python and Ruby and so on, but most plugins were written in VimScript, which is a capable but awkward language, and a slow one. This meant that IDE features tended to be pretty modest back then, with projects like C tags representing the peak of intelligent IDE-like code navigation features. If you fast forward a decade, so much has changed. NeoVim brought a host of improvements, and the competitive pressure spurred Vim's own maintainer, Bram Molinar, to roll out equivalent, but unfortunately not compatible analogs in Vim itself. The advent of synchronous jobs and the language server protocol have led to a burgeoning of sophisticated IDE-like functionality in Vim. And while NeoVim charges forward, Vim 9 is under development too, including some changes that would have been unimaginable in the past. Things like a new version of VimScript, which is compiled for better performance, and which eliminates many puzzling idiosyncrasies of the older version. Now, one of the ironic things about all this evolution is that with each passing year, Vim has become a little bit more like Emacs. You've probably heard the old joke about Emacs being a great operating system, lacking only a decent editor. While it's fun to poke fun at Emacs for being huge and sprawling, the value proposition is obvious. You can live inside Emacs if you want. If we think in terms of composing tools together, Emacs tends to be one of the outermost layers. Emacs is a container for other processes. You can stay inside Emacs, not only to edit text, but to send and read emails, debug computer programs, browse the web, manage your calendar, or to-do list, and much more. For most of its life, the mental model for Vim was the exact opposite. Rather than something you lived inside, Vim was a scalpel for editing text. You would pick it up when you needed it, call it from other places. For example, Mutt, the email client, or Git, the version control system, would spawn a copy of Vim whenever you needed to edit something. Vim was so small and light that the startup cost was imperceptible. In fact, the concrete incarnation of the program itself didn't matter as much anymore. It retreated into the background almost to the point of invisibility, leaving behind only the abstract idea of a minimal set of editing tools for manipulating text modally. So, browsers and IDEs and email clients would borrow the idea of modal editing and implement VI modes in a way that they would never have contemplated for an Emacs mode, unless you could call some basic Emacs style bindings a mode. Such bindings don't fundamentally change anything about the editing paradigm. 
They just provide some common shortcuts for people with their muscle memory configured a certain way. But modal editing is an entirely different ballgame. So Vim has changed a lot and the ecosystem has grown and matured. If you want, you can now, to a large extent, live inside Vim, the way Emacs users can live inside Emacs. If you want, you can use Vim as a container for other processes, instead of as a mere process to be stuck inside another container. But at its heart, fortunately, despite the proliferation of increasingly sophisticated plugins that you can install, Vim at its core is still minimal and fast, and can still be used as a lightweight tool that you pick up when needed. It preserves the defining value proposition that has drawn so many people to it over the years. Most obviously, it's that Vim's implementation of modal editing is just sublime, no pun intended. When it comes to manipulating text, it is just obscenely good at it. And I think it's a journey that all of us who choose Vim and stick with it go through. There are three ep epiphanies that you arrive at, sooner or later, that explain all, the, all of the magical appeal of Vim. The first is that Vim is fast. And not just fast to start up, but fast to respond in terms of keyboard latency. And fast, even more importantly, in the sense of minimizing the distance between the intentions of the human at the keyboard and the actions they must carry out in the editor to get it to do what they want. The second epiphany is that Vim is easy to learn, after all, despite all the jokes about being stuck in Vim for multiple years unable to exit. And finally, the third epiphany is that Vim is powerful like a lever. Because once you learn the core principles and patterns, you can combine them in predictable ways to do many additional things without a steep learning curve. Let me give you some examples. Vim is fast, and one of the reasons is that it explicitly optimizes for the common tasks that you find yourself doing dozens or even hundreds of times a day when editing text. For example, normal mode commands like O and Shift O which open a new line for editing below or above the current line. In other editors, to carry that action out, you find yourself doing extraneous things that aren't actually directly related to the thing you're wanting to do, which is start inserting text on the line below. Instead, you find yourself doing things like pressing Control or Command right arrow to jump to the end of the current line, which has nothing to do with the business you have on the next line, and then pressing Enter to get to where you can actually start doing what you want. In Vim, this operation is a single key press away, and very close to where your hands rest on the keyboard home row. Closer still on keyboard layouts like Colmec or Dvorak, which I don't actually know how to pronounce. The kind of thoughtful optimization there is pervasive in the standard normal mode mappings, starting with the famous HJKL quartet for cursor movement and extending to pretty much every available key on the keyboard. Just in terms of simple mechanical advantage, here indeed is an axe worth sharpening. Practice the normal mode commands like a jazz musician would practice scales and improvisation. The next point, Vim is actually, surprisingly, easy to learn. Almost all of the core operations can be remembered using mnemonic tricks like CIT, standing for change inside tag, which is trivially easy to remember. Or via intuition and pattern matching. For example, an uppercase version of some key usually does the logical extension or inverse of the lowercase version. Or prefixing a key with G often does an augmented version or a variant of an operation. Compared to other things I've learned in my life, Vim really wasn't all that bad. It was de definitely easier than learning a new keyboard layout, for instance. I felt quite productive after mere days of switching to Vim, whereas learning the Colmac keyboard layout required weeks of intensive effort before I really felt comfortable. And the final point about Vim being powerful. Vim's power is the power of composability. You learn the component pieces, and you can combine them to multiply their value. Once you've understood the general grammar of repeat counts, verbs, motions, and so on, you can assemble together operations to do some very powerful things without having to individually learn all the permutations. If you know n verbs and m motions, that means you know n times m combinations. That's almost quadratic growth right there. And for once, that growth is a good thing. So they say practice makes perfect. And the good news is that the core design of Vim is so fundamentally good that it really rewards focus practice. The effort you invest in improving your basic text editing skills will pay you dividends from now onwards, every time you edit text. And focus practice is one path towards mastery. 
It is a way to sharpen the axe. But the other way, and the thing that I want to spend the rest of this talk on, is the task of refining your setup, to turn Vim into a tool that fits you like a glove, so that it becomes more like an extension of your will than an external object. And that brings us back to why I have a .files repo with nearly 4,000 commits in it so far. Vim and its ecosystem have changed a lot, but keeping up to date with those changes only goes some of the way to explaining my activity. Let's talk a little bit then about what that means in terms of sharpening the X. I think Zach Holman was very close to having it right when he said 10 years ago that dot .files are meant to be forked. He was saying that dot .files should be promiscuously shared and customized to suit each developer's needs and taste. In the end, your dot .files become a unique expression of your preferences, needs, habits, and in a way, even your identity. Given time and freedom, no two developers' dot .file setups will be alike. They'll be as unique as fingerprints. I mostly agree with that, but with a disclaimer. I don't think you should base your dot .files on somebody else's by forking. Instead of forking, start with git init, an empty slate. That means an empty directory inside of which you are going to carefully construct over time your ideal development setup. Once you've got this empty directory and started populating it with configuration files, there are a number of tools that you can use to actually put these files in the right places and keep them up to date. I've listed a few here. One common choice is GNU STO, which describes itself as a Simlink farm manager. In practice, what that actually means is that you can keep your dot .files neatly organized in a Git repo and then make them appear appropriately elsewhere on the file system, such as in your home directory via Simlinking. Another one, that I used for a while was Ansible, which is a full-blown system configuration tool. This can be used to do much more than just simlink dot files, such as installing packages, scheduling cron jobs, applying tweaks to shared system files, and so on. But it is complicated, and the tool isn't really optimized for this use case. It's really intended to do large-scale infrastructure management, such as deploying and maintaining fleets of machines across a network. Using it for dot .file management is kind of like driving in a nail with a 10,000 pound hammer. At the opposite end of the spectrum, you could use a simple script written in Ruby, Python, Bash, or any other scripting language. There are many past examples of such scripts online, and I've got a link here to one that I've used in the past. There are also tools and frameworks especially built for dot .file management. Here's another example from a former colleague of mine called Dot. Finally, I'll mention Fig which is short for config. That's what I'm using nowadays. I basically took the idea of Ansible, the 10,000 pound hammer, and I ignored most of the 3,400 modules that come with it and wrote a tiny little tool that does nothing more than I need to set up a machine and keep it up to date. So you have a Git repo now and a way of plugging it in to a working system. What should you do next? I like the idea of starting from scratch, literally from a blank .vmrc file or an init.vim file. And then we build it up from there, line by line. Nothing goes in without ex understanding exactly what it does. Not only do you make the editor behave the way you want to, but you gain an understanding of both the default behavior and the modifications necessary to change that behavior. Here's an early, early example from my repo. This one is from May 2009, when I'd been using Vim for about five months. In this commit, I'm adjusting the value of the T timeout lens setting to improve responsiveness. Now, when I make a change like this, I don't really hold much hope of remembering the details of why. With so many settings, and some of them quite subtle, I know that I have to record the rationale for making the change, or it will be lost in the sands of time. But if it's in a commit message, then it is only ever a quick git blame away. And after doing this over many years, I end up with a self-documenting VMRC file that contains these short comments to remind me what each setting is for. And if I ever need more info, I can dive into Vim's excellent help with colon H. And if I need even more context, I can git blame or look at the log to see when and why I changed a particular setting. I've maintained this habit all along because experience has shown me again and again the value of externalizing a record of my thought processes and activity into an archive that I can search at a later time. Here's some proof. This one is a commit message I wrote 11 years later, and you can see that I'm still explaining what I'm doing and why. In this case, it's leveraging a new NeoVim feature 
to highlight the yanked region using an auto command. As always, I explain what the change is, my rationale for making it, and I include whatever information or links I'll need to make sense of it if I look at it again in the future. Not only is it useful to have a record like this for me personally, but there are two other benefits. One, I know that other people who look in my .files repo can use that extra context to help them make informed decisions as they craft their own environments, as opposed to blindly copying from one place into another. And two, it's liberating for me, mentally speaking, to know that I don't have to agonize about remembering all the details of every decision I make, because there is a part of my memory which resides in a distributed fashion across multiple hosts in the form of an immutable commit history. I don't need to remember the answers themselves, just that they exist in a place that I can find them again. So that's a little bit about the value of discipline, of doing things in a rigorous and consistent way. I call it tweaking, but the truth is, done with care, it starts to resemble software engineering. But discipline is just a question of how we do things. It doesn't speak to what we should do. What can we do to go beyond tweaking and follow a path that leads us towards mastery? Now, I'm being very careful about the language I use here. I want to emphasize that mastery is a journey more than a destination. I still learn new things about Vim every single week, and I forget some of the things that I previously learned. So if mastery is a destination, I don't know if I'll ever arrive there. I feel much more comfortable talking about it as a process. On my YouTube channel, I've posted over, well, almost 100 Vim screencasts over the last four years. And I've seen again and again how information that I shared one week and which reflected at the time my best understanding of things was later superseded by new understanding. When you're constantly changing and growing and the environment is changing around you, it is hard to feel any sense of mastery. Rather than feeling like an expert, studying Vim makes you feel like a perpetual student. And it's quite a satisfying state to be in when you think about it. The primary tool that will drive you towards mastery will be seeking out solutions for your own pain points. When you start from an empty VimRC, these might be simple things like figuring out how to show line numbers, or use spaces or tabs, or turn hard wrapping on or off. It might end up being things like how to get italics rendering properly or have the mouse working properly in the terminal, or how to use autocomplete or snippets. Maybe you want to figure out how to use Vim for writing email or managing your wiki or to-do list. As your knowledge of Vim grows, so too will your awareness of little edge cases that you'd like to smooth out, and your appetite for taking on bigger and bigger challenges will increase. In my decade with Vim, I've built plugins and used it for email, blogging, to manage a wiki, for note-taking, and obviously for programming. And just like the myth that most humans only use 10% of their brain, I still feel like I'm only using about 10% of what Vim has to offer. This makes it a pretty exciting platform to learn about because there's this sense of vast untapped potential waiting to be, to be unleashed all the time. And if you run out of obvious ways to sharpen your axe, you can take inspiration from other people's setups and ways of working. Go on fishing expeditions, looking at other people's dot files for ideas. Observe other people at work. You might be in a work envir environment where pair programming takes place. And even if you aren't, there are always screencasts and streams to look at. Seeing what other people can do with Vim may expand your horizons in ways that inspire you and give you ideas for continued improvement. Just don't forget the golden rule of never copy-pasting without understanding. Keep up your discipline of understanding every change, document your process, and whenever you need it, your contacts will be there waiting for you in your kit history. Now, another path to improvement is through making plugins. Now, when I make a plugin, it isn't out of a desire to make something popular. It's fundamentally because I have a need that isn't currently fulfilled to my satisfaction. This is the primary driver along the path to mastery again. Solve specific problems. So you do this. You make a plugin and you end up sharpening the axe. If the result seems useful, then you share it. If you build it, they will come. Or they won't. It doesn't matter. The important part is that you improve your environment and probably learn something along the way. One of the things about releasing something as a plugin is that people may use it in contexts that do not match your own. This means that you may have to do feature detection to make the plugin compatible with a broader range of environments. This is a good habit that you can backport to your own VimRC. For example, if, you can make a, if it can help you to make a single VimRC that will work for both Vim and NeoVim, 
and will degrade gracefully if you find yourself on a machine with an older version. That's what you can see in this screenshot with those if statements that check for the existence of features. For occasions where you can't directly detect a feature, you can resort to checking for a specific version or even a patch. That can be useful, for example, if you want to conditionally execute a workaround for a bug that was fixed in a particular BIM patch. Here's a little case study of extracting a plugin. I created one called Scalpel that streamlines a common use case I have of moving through a file, substituting a word. NeoVim in particular has some nice features to preview changes so that you can make them en masse without fear of breaking anything. But the use case I'm talking about here is where the buffer may be large and you may want to pause and evaluate the site of each potential change before actually performing it. So this starts with a few lines in my VMRC because I'm not entirely happy with the alternatives. I could use a mapping like the one shown here to star ncgn, which allows you to jump from word to word, replacing each one. Star jumps to the next occurrence of the word under the cursor. This effectively puts that word in the search register. Shift N puts us back where we started. C starts a change, and GN indicates the motion of which we wish to make the change, which in this case means the next match. So the overall effect is to change the current word, and if I hit dot after leaving insert mode, the change will be made to the next match, and the next as I continue to hit dot. Now, this mapping works, but I don't like the way it's blind. I can't see where the cursor is going to land in order to preview the change before making it. By the time I get there, the substitution has already been made. And it pollutes my jump list too, because I'm jumping through the buffer. So I end up using the substitute command instead. Here, percent defines a range, which says we want to operate over the entire buffer. S is short for substitute. I specify a pattern and a replacement. And G says to do the substitution globally, which means for all matches on any given line instead of just the first. And finally, C tells Vim to prompt me for confirmation before making each change. Now this command doesn't suffer from the problems of the mapping, but it is annoying in different ways. For example, if I'm in the middle of the file, it's going to jump all the way to the top and then work down to the bottom. I'd much rather start from the middle, work down from there, and then loop around to the top and continue back down to the middle, ending where I started. So I make a little custom function to do what I want. And after using it for a while, it seems solid enough to extract into a plugin. As you can see here, it's a little over 40 lines of Vim script all up. Now, making something into a plugin applies a constructive kind of pressure on the code, for the same reasons that making anything open source can increase its quality. It doesn't matter if nobody ever uses it. The mere fact that they might use it is an incentive to pay attention to edge cases, provide documentation, and so on. From then on, it's a case of relentlessly improving the snippet until there is nothing left to fix or you run into some insurmountable barrier that stops further progress. What we're looking at here is the entire commit history of the Scalpel project over the course of four years. Most of the commits are just chores, but I've highlighted the actual substantive improvements and fixes using arrows. They're just small things like fixing a Vim script edge case, adding configuration options, adding the ability to work in visual mode, following best practices for registering auto commands, suppressing unwanted messages, adding support for pattern delimiters other than slashes, fixing a bug with replacement sequences, fixing compatibility with old Vim versions, respecting the G default setting, hardening the code to guard against nested reader commands and adding some missing escaping. That's all of them. Some are little things that I noticed from using the plugin. Others came in from user reports for bugs that I never would have run into on my own. And there are one or two things that result from pressure from users to support new use cases. Nothing that takes us into the territory of bloat, just little things. But without a doubt, the code is better for having been exposed to community usage. And it taught me something along the way. For example, the G default setting, which I'd never heard of until the user brought it up. So at the end of this process, what happened to my 40 lines of Vim script? The bulk of the plugin is actually comments now, 308 lines. Those are extracted and transformed into documentation. The non-comment source lines tally up to 135 in all, so it's still small. The story of Scalpel is just one example of action sharpening taken from a decade of dot .file tweaking and workflow optimization. I want to close with this XKCD comic, which may well have been hovering around in the back of your mind ever since the beginning. 
it seeks to answer the question of how much optimization is too much. You wouldn't work for a day to optimize a minute long task that you rarely perform, but you might do it if the task was frequent enough or costly enough. The point is, there actually is an objective guideline that you can follow to ensure that your investment in axe sharpening is appropriate and proportional to the expected benefit. Being aware of the trade-off can keep us away from obsessively refactoring or polishing our tools as a way of procrastinating. If we're pragmatic, axe sharpening can not only be a lot of fun, but a great productivity booster as well. I hope you're all feeling motivated to continue the good work of refining your setups. Now, Before I go, I'm going to include here a link to those famous dot files that are to be stolen from, not forked, um, as well as to my blog, where I will be posting a transcript of the talk. And then there's my YouTube channel, which if you're seeing this, you're probably already on it. So thanks for listening and good luck.